the island of Rhodes. We next put in at Rhodes, but alas, there was no Colossus to be seen there now. We walked to the top of the island along a modern street, which curved up between neat, respectable seaside houses, such as one might see at Bournemouth or at Durban. Uh, how disappointing it was to me to look into such a succession of neat little gardens, each one with a gravel path and a mown lawn and a banana tree in the corner. Yet even so, my spirits were high. It was wonderful to be about in the bright sunshine, and everywhere I saw dark men on donkeys with swallows darting over their heads, backward and forward over the shining road and over the villa railings. Once we reached the top of the hill, the prospect altered. We first passed three gigantic pillars recently excavated lying by the roadside, and then came to a position from them which we could see the coastline of the island. The road was deep in dust. The whole prospect reminded me of Portland, and more than ever so when, approaching the edge of the wild cliff, a raven rose balancing itself against the wind and uttering its familiar croak. It was now possible for me to imagine Tiberius living here, possible to envisage him living as a private citizen and walking up from the old town to these heights, his head full of I know not what, melancholy meditations upon the phantom quality of man's life upon earth, a quality that it was only possible to redeem, if possible at all, through the instrument of the most dangerous of our senses. Far away we could see a small Greek city nestling under the green hillside, and between us it were terraced plots of cultivation, all dusty and dry in spite of their innumerable water windmills. Without doubt on many an occasion, the eyes of Tiberius had followed these slopes, all his studies in mathematics and astrology not sufficiently absorbing to allow his sombre soul to be rid of depression at the sight of a lovely girl whistling to the finches, and not for him. There never was such dust as these high roads. The leaves of the fig trees were dusty, the olive trees also, and the wayside thistles. We returned down a narrow lane between high walls, walls that were built with huge stones, many of them showing traces of ancient classical moulding, besmeared with sluttish time. Occasionally it was possible by climbing from one projection to another to see over the walls into the olive yards they sheltered. I observed that the houses, farmhouses I suppose, were flat-footed, excuse me, flat-roofed. They were, for the most part, painted white. It was only possible to get a momentary glance, and then down one was once more in the lane, one's feet kicking against the flattened-out leaves of cactuses, which lay half-buried in the dust and had the appearance of outworn boxing gloves. Prodigious cactuses of the prickly pear variety grew everywhere. At each door or gate there was one, and at every few yards they stretched their elbows over the wall, like the angular, jointed claws of giant lobsters. We passed a Muslim graveyard outside the town and entered it. It is not always wise for unbelievers to tread over the ground where the corpses of these bonehead fanatics lie awaiting their resurrection. Nobody took any notice of us, however. I suppose the truth is that Rhodes has been so debauched by foreigners that they no longer care. The tombstones in the littered and shabby cemetery were the most dainty I ever saw. Lightly balanced, slender, they seemed admirably adapted for the strange decorative letterings carved upon them. We disturbed two starved dogs that had curled themselves up in a sun-dried hole. They were so thin that their bones had broken clean through their skins, and yet they were able still to snarl and show their teeth. So irrepressible is the assertion of life. We entered a modern hotel and found it to be, as we had suspected, a terrible place. Even the expensive tea it provided, its only attraction, was undrinkable. It was a quite exceptional fortress of western vulgarity, fronting directly on the sea. Its interior was as false as its outside. A large, workable map of the island was the only honest thing I saw in it. For the rest, it was inhabited by pretentious painted ladies and dubious-looking flashy men, dressed in white flannels with black stripes down them. 
Some of the latter were talking English in a false self-conscious manner, before crossing their legs as they settled themselves down in armchairs ornamented with ostentatious chintz covers. Their eyes scanned the room with aggressive complacence. We were glad enough to escape. The waiter was not even able to gratify our wish for honey, for all his subservient manners and breast white as a nodding magpie. We spent the rest of the evening walking about the old town. Most of the more ancient buildings looked Venetian in style. How crowded it was, and what faces in the ghetto.